Welcome to another program in our series, Free Thinking Forum. Uh, my, my name is Bill Weir, I'm producer and host, and I'm delighted to bring you today uh, the author of The Crusade for Forgotten Souls, Reforming Minnesota's Mental Institutions, 1946-1954, by Susan Bartlett Foot. Welcome, Susan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure I, to be here. I've been looking forward to this time when we will get acquainted with this book and I will learn more about one of my mentors, Arthur Foote. Now, uh, can you briefly describe to our audience what this book is about? Well, I'd be happy to. The Crusade for Forgotten Souls, and that title comes from the governor of Minnesota at the time, who labeled the reform effort the crusade is the untold story of the reform of mental institutions called at the time insane asylums in Minnesota in the 1940s. It was the first mental health advocacy by ordinary people who turned the governor into a passionate advocate. And these people, citizens, built a statewide movement, the first in the country, developed the design for the reform and worked tirelessly for the passage of legislation that catapulted Minnesota at the time to leadership in the nation on mental health reform. That's how it got to be so good, uh, good uh, 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 a way of treating people with uh, when they had mental health problems. Uh, well, this particular reform effort did slow, uh, and that's a, the, um, described in the book, and Min Minnesota did fall back um, oh. to the average for a time yeah. after, um, uh, after the reform movement. But it was quite a, a change. Uh, yes. Uh, and, but first of all, let me ask, what, what made you uh, write this book? What prompted you to? Well, it fell on my head. And that's a true <laughs> story. <laughs> and what fell on my head was a bag of papers um, that had belonged to Arthur Foote, who was my father-in-law, um, papers he had saved after he retired in 1970 and lived for 30 more years in retirement. And when he passed away, the papers were sent to my son as mementos of his grandfather. My son didn't know what to do with them, put them on the top of his closet, and 10 years after that, when I was helping him clean out his closet, they fell on my head. <laughs> and what they were, yeah. making them so interesting to me, a retired professor, was a scrapbook of yellowed newspaper clippings with headlines and pictures and page one of all these uh, articles about um, aspects of reform with the governor and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, stories of the legislature and so on, and some speeches, hand typed, mm -hmm. um, and other personal papers that related to his role in this, in this movement. Well, he had a big role, didn't he, as uh, chairman of or of a committee? Yes, he was. He was really the leader of of a committee that had been put together, um, that worked on a reform effort. Um, so, but no one knew anything about it, current, you know, in modern times, and so... Because the papers were uh, up on the, <laughs> the high shelf. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, uh, so that got me interested, um, and it raised as many questions as it did answers, and so it started me on a, basically a, an odyssey of discovery to find out what was this, and who was involved, and what did it mean? Well, good. Now, who were in the mental asylums in Minnesota in the 1940s? Well, uh, this is a really sad um, period of time, um, and it was going on in all the states. But in Minnesota, there were 10,000 Minnesotans who were incarcerated in seven mental institutions. 
and another 2,800 called at the time imbeciles who were the developmentally disabled who were also put in large institutions and mm -hmm. um, basically away from um, um, home, away from society. Uh, in the mental institutions, and this was something very, uh, really interesting, 35% of the people admitted and about 15% of the population in these places were senile elderly. Um, before nursing homes or rest homes, this is where old people were sent if there was no one to care for them. So that's where I'd be. That's where we'd all be. Yep, <laughs> indeed. Not uh, a good place to be. Most of them were tied to the beds, called bed patients, and, um, and uh, had very little attention paid to them at all. My goodness. That was our long-term care system. And another... And, uh, and, and physically restrained or chemically restrained to yes, the bed? Yes, yes. Um, uh, even lobotomies? Um, that's right. The uh, uh, restraint use, and, and this is an interesting fact as well, um, Minnesota was w among the worst of the states in terms of the percentage of people who were in restraints, often for hours or even days at a time. Um, a lot of people who were there w were not mentally ill by any definition. They were misfits, grieving widows, inconvenient wives, and others with transient problems who were committed and could not get out unless their guardian or their family member who committed them uh, uh, permitted that to happen. That is horrible. And about half of them, half of the population, had mental health problems that we would identify today with few effect, uh, effective treatments. And they were essentially, if they were able-bodied, they worked, uh, worked in the uh, institution. Um, and if they were not, they were um, idle, um, neglected, well. overcrowded, uh, poor diet, uh, just a whole litany of, of uh, terrible, terrible conditions. Unpalatable food, and, uh, and uh, I understand that some were left naked after uh, using the tub that was also a storeroom? Yes, yes. Uh. The, the, the condition of the buildings um, and were, was really serious. Now, these were state institutions and the state was responsible for uh, the funding of them and at the period of time of this story, which is um, in the depression and slightly after, the conditions had deteriorated significantly. Mm -hmm. um, due to the so, to the economic so why didn't conditions. the public do something? Well, that's interesting too. The stigma, and this is this is really important for people to understand. The stigma was extreme. Uh, people who had uh, family members in the institutions were so ashamed, and they didn't talk about it. And the institutions were set situated outside of big urban areas, isolated. Um, easy to uh, ha be out of sight, out of mind. Um, and the cynical sort of state bureaucracy really encouraged isolation, discouraged visiting, um, and uh, for all intents and purposes, these were, as the title indicates, forgotten souls. Terrible. A, a real conspiracy of silence from the state bureaucracy. That's right. And you know, the, the press too um, really wrote about only what the state wanted them to say. And mm -hmm. so the articles were all about if there was anything at all. But then there was some national attention. Yeah, to, now this, is, this um, time period was pretty important in, um, in, in the history even at the national level. And, and this is uh, interesting too. During the war, there were conscientious objectors who did not serve um, in active duty. And many of them were assigned to work in the mental institutions across the country because some of the men who had been uh, 
attendants and others working in the institutions were drafted. But these young men who came from humanitarian backgrounds were horrified at what they saw. And they organized, um, even while the war was still on, they organized um, to try to communicate what the problems were. And there was a Life magazine article in early 1946 when the war was over. And for, for uh, your listeners who aren't uh, as old as we are, Life magazine was really the only source of photography and other information for um, people to find out about it. And those photographs had quite an impact. They then. had an impact. However, in Minnesota, the newspapers uh, contemporaneous to this Life magazine article said, um, no snake pits in Minnesota. And the really? article said, this was uh, the Pioneer Press in October of 1946, all is well in Minnesota. The institutions are clean and they're well staffed and uh, they could use more money, but uh, uh, everything is going fine. And what, <laughs> that doesn't sound like a thorough investigative reporting. No, it was not investigative reporting. And so Just the public was really... Just what the public officials told them. What the public officials and the superintendents told them, so, yes. Uh, it, there were things that surprised you in this research. Yeah. Well, you know, it was a question for me: is how did it get, how did it get started in Minnesota? And um, I was intrigued as I was starting to do my research, reading um, Governor Luther Youngdahl's biography. Mm -hmm. There was a line in it that said, um, "It all started with Angla Shea, an attendant." in the mental hospitals. And I, I was intrigued with, by I've that. I've never heard of her. Never heard of her. She was not mentioned in any of the newspaper articles. She was not mentioned in any of the materials that I could find. And so I went on a hunt for this mystery lady, learning at first that Angla means angel in Norwegian. Ah. Um, and I tracked down her descendants. She was born in 1895, so of course she was long gone. She had died in, in the 1970s, I think. I found a relative. Um, I wrote to them uh, and discovered that they had boxes of materials, her diaries, contemporaneous to this period of time, as well as our, uh, stories that she had written what a find. And it was an incredible find. It's a historian's dream. And it opened up not only who she was, but because she worked in the institutions and because she wrote these diaries, she gave voice to these forgotten souls. And so the first chapter of the book is really vignettes of people who lived in these institutions that Angla cared for. Um, a very, very powerful and unique picture of what was going on. And so you, you finally you found this information about Angua Shea, S-C-H-E-Y, right. uh, through one of her relatives. But uh, were there bar other barriers that Angua Shea well, encountered? It, it, the, the materials explained the question that I had, which is, how did this young woman who was born in northern Minnesota, poor Norwegian immigrant farmer family, end up being, according to the governor of the state, the person who started it all? Um, and her motivation, which is described in great detail in the book, we don't have time to get um, into it too deeply, but her motivation was her father who had um, committed himself to Fergus Falls State Hospital in 1928. He was depressed. Um, Even? He, he was a very interesting man. He was a free thinker, which is appropriate to say on this free thinking forum, in northern Minnesota at a time when it was not uh, um, socially acceptable to not conform to the very pietistic um, uh, constraints of the Lutheranism in the in the uh, town, um, and he 
he and Engla were devoted to each other and she suffered a lot because of his suffering and when he went into the institution she made a vow that she would work to make things better for others and that's what she did but when she got there she was horrified at what she saw so she began first to um, try to make things better just within the little world that she lived in. She was rebuffed by nurses, she was ridiculed, um, she was considered a troublemaker, um, she had no opportunity for advancement. Um, and Troublemaker because she was trying to help the patient? Yes, yes, because oh, the, it, it was a pretty cynical um, world. Um, there were, I think, many uh, wonderful people who worked in the institutions, but the conditions were so bad and it, it was impossible to, to, uh, to do much for them mm -hmm. um, without having the cooperation of the powers that be. Yes. Yeah. So uh, you, you mentioned Unitarians, and how, how did they get involved? Well, and that was another question, because once I understood Angla and her commitment to patients... They're sort of free thinkers. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but then how did she find herself... Um, um, how did the Unitarians connect with this, um, uh, this um, woman who wanted reform? And what I learned was that she had, independently of her own family, uh, discovered the, the Unitarians, the humanists, at First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis um, in the 1930s. And as she began to start to speak out beyond the confines of the institutions where she worked, uh, she went to her pastor um, and told him about the, the conditions and also uh, tried to um, get contributions so that she could buy the materials that these conscientious objectors in their new organization were, um, were preparing to, to educate people about uh, conditions and how to make it better. So oh, that would have been John Dietrich, her senior minister. Well, actually, it was his successor. Oh, oh. She, oh. Was, uh, she was attracted to Unitarianism because of John Dietrich, who was a who was one of the first humanists um, putting the values of this world as more uh, important than concern about the next world. Um, Uniting around values instead of doctrine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And his successor um, um, was a, um, a minister named Raymond Bragg, mm -hmm. who um, happened to be there when Angla was um, becoming an advocate. And that was her connection. Now the Unitarians at this point in time, there were about 2,000 in Minnesota. And after the war, there was an effort in the Unitarian Church to, they called it Unitarian Advance. The world was in such bad shape and they wanted to get active to make changes to make conditions better for people generally. And each church was encouraged to do so. And so Minnesota had a statewide Unitarian conference in, um, every year. And in 1946, the conference considered mental health as an issue to take on as a, as a statewide church. And Engla uh, spoke up at that, didn't Yes, you? Angla, and it's in her diaries, I was so excited to find that she got a time off and left Rochester State Hospital where she worked and came up, hitchhiked up to uh, the cities and came to that conference. And when people in the, in the group said, well, maybe things aren't as bad as you say, Angla stood up and we have her words um, and she told people what things were really like and persuaded this group to take on the issue. And that is why in Luther Youngdahl's biography, he says, Angla Shea started it all. She was the catalyst. Good for her. She, yes. She's a Minnesota hero. And I, one of my goals in talking about this book 
is to make her name known. Yes. And now, uh, this was at the Minnesota conference, and Arthur Foote probably would have been there, wouldn't he? Yes, he, he was not only there, he was selected by the group to lead the what they called the Mental Hospital um, Committee of the Unitarian Conference. And he took that role on. And what was uh, what is interesting for the readers is the sort of the social action philosophy that he worked very hard to bring the um, the activists within the Unitarian orbit um, to this approach, which was to reject or what he called the arduous climb, the arduous climb over anger and in indignation to cooperative, sympathetic service. The goal being to improve things, not by just being angry, but by educating themselves on all aspects of the nature of the problem, by being responsible about developing solutions, by building constructive support, by not just pointing fingers and attacking, but actually um, understanding how everyone could be brought along to improve the, the situation. It was a very constructive approach, and frankly, if they had gone out in 1947 when they decided to, um, to uh, go public, if they had just gone out angry without knowing what was going on and without being willing to work hard to educate others constructively, they would have been easily defeated. Yes. Now, uh, we're running short on time, but I do want to ask about the interaction between Arthur Foote and the governor of Minnesota, Luther Youngdahl. Luther Youngdahl was the governor. He was a um, Swedish Lutheran Republican. He was not a party man. He was a man of great um, humanitarian. He, he took very seriously his Christian um, uh, belief about the dignity of every human being. And he was, um, at first, reluctant to get involved because he was afraid, uh, once understanding the conditions, uh, that it might be a difficult political problem and he might be blamed because he was the governor. These were his people. But Arthur pointed out to him. Arthur pointed out in a wonderful dramatic uh, moment, um, the two of them together, and he said, this is political dynamite only in hands other than your own. And instantly, this governor understood that if he got out ahead of the issue and embraced it himself, that he could own it and he could carry it forward, and that's just what he did. Good for him. Good for him. And, <laughs> and, and Arthur. And the Unitarian group stood behind him every step of the way. Well, they, they succeeded uh, with legislation in 1949, is that right? That's right. Comprehensive legislation in 1949, and um, um, a lot of details, but there's really two important pieces of this legislation. The first is that it included, and this is what the Unitarians had insisted upon, what they called fundamental human guarantees to which all mental patients are entitled. This yes. was 1949. No other state had anything like that. So this was um, uh, critically important and many of the details of the legislation um, devolved from this notion of fundamental human guarantees. And the first of those guarantees was dignity. Mm -hmm. And the second was that their goal was to build a comprehensive, and they use these terms, a comprehensive modern mental health system. A mental health system that would not just close the institutions, that came later, but convert the institutions from warehouses mm 
to places of care with research embedded in all of them so that there would be better understanding and better care and hopefully cures. It also included education, prevention, and a community um, support system so that there would be what we would now call a continuum of care. Again, 1949, we're not there yet, but the vision, the vision was really um, exceptional. Now I know you have a lot in the book on Dr. Ralph Rosen. 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 Rosen, yes. Uh, who led that effort. Uh, very visionary. Yes, and he's another. Uh, I spoke at, at Mayo uh, Clinic um, a few weeks ago, and I said, "This man should be a hero." He was a, a Minnesota boy, born and bred, uh, Jewish um, from the range, educated at the U, superintendent at Hastings, abolished restraints even before it was discussed uh, at the state level. And he had the vision of building this system, um, this new modern mental health system. And Dr. Rawson said quite wisely that he needed 10 years to get it done. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, he only got a few years. So uh, abolishing the restraints, uh, the straitjackets and right. so on. Right, yes. Uh, I, I saw a picture uh, in your book, uh, Dr. Lu uh, Governor uh, Youngdahl burning straight taxes. Yes, at yes. This was this. Uh, this was right after the passage of the legislation. It was actually um, Halloween night at Anoka State Hospital. Ralph Rawson had just been appointed, and the burning of the straight jackets by Luther Youngdahl was a signal to everyone in the state that change would begin. Now. Your book, we've, we've got less than a, uh, two minutes left. Inspiration, what ordinary people can do when they put their minds to it. Absolutely. You, you certainly created an inspiring story here. And admonition, protection of the patient requires our eternal vigilance. That's right. And that's a quote from and Governor Youngdahl. Yeah, people are going to want to buy this book I because sure there's so, so much more <laughs> in here. And uh, you can order online from University of Minnesota Press. It's available uh, also from online and, uh, and in the stores of Barnes and Noble and, and online from Amazon and your independent bookstore can order it for you if, if, if they don't have it in stock. So. Uh, take note, the crusade for forgotten souls. Uh, we'll learn a lot about Minnesota and how great some of the people are here and inspiring right. others. And we so, need to get back to it, yes. Thank you so much, <laughs> thank Susan, you. for it's a pleasure. Uh, introducing us to this book. Thank you. And to writing in the book. So,